Welcome back, everyone. Hope you managed to stretch your legs and have a quick break. Um, delighted now to welcome our first keynote speaker of the conference, Sam Olson, who hopefully you can see on your screen next to me, who is going to be speaking on young people and the COVID-19 recovery, the role of business. Let me do a short intro to Sam. So Sam is Chief Executive of, of Movement to Work, and Movement to Work is a voluntary collaboration of UK employers committed to tackling youth unemployment. Um, she's currently actually on secondment um, from the UK government's department Department for Education. And you can obviously read more about Sam's experience in the programme, but just to pick out a, a few highlights. So she's run a number of major projects across a government, developing diverse teams, championing inclusion and diversity. She's also spent um, over 10 years working uh, with Virgin Atlantic, and during which time she started up uh, Virgin Nigeria whilst living in Lagos. She's also um, chair of Henry, which is a charity established to support healthy eating and exercise in young children. And just before we came on air, she was telling me all about her other interesting uh, roles. So really fascinating. Do have a read of the um, programme for more. Um, just before I hand over to Sam, please remember that the chat box and the Q&A uh, box is open to the right of your screen. So if you do have any points you want to raise or questions for Sam, please do put them into that uh, box and I'll put them to her towards the end. And I also know from our chat before that um, Sam is very keen to make this session interactive. So please um, do participate because I know she's going to ask you a few questions as we go. Another quick point, you can actually on, on hop in upvote any questions that you would like answered. So there's a little thumb um, thumbs up but button when someone types in a question. So if you like that question and you definitely want to see it answered, please do click that button. OK, enough from me. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Melissa. Great introduction there. Um, as Melissa said, I would like to try and make this session as interactive as we can in a slightly virtual world. So uh, I'll be asking you a couple of questions as we go through that I'd like to hear your responses from so that we can all share the mutual experiences that we've got around work experience and working with businesses in this space. So as Melissa says, uh, Sam Olson, CEO of Movement to Work, uh, we're a charity funded by business with one purpose, one purpose, that's it, to level up the playing field for young people, to remove barriers to employment through quality work experience placements. In its simplest terms, we get businesses to run more impactful employability programmes, more being the crucial word there. So I'm going to use this session for a bit of personal research. I'm fascinated at the moment by people's first ever work experience um, and I'll share the insights at the end of the session uh, with Melissa. So could I please ask you to write your first ever work experience in the chat function and what skills you use today? So I'm not talking about your first paid proper job. I'm talking about the stuff you might have done when you were 13, 14, 18, whenever it may be. Mine, I'm happy to start by sharing, was working in a hotel serving breakfast and cleaning bedrooms. It was a delight. I was so proud of that first job. Um, it gave me a motivation about reward and working with people and being part of the team. Probably some of the things I use today. Uh, I learned that the customer is always right. You don't always like that, but the customer is always right. And how many flows through businesses but also how to change a bed quite quickly. And that last one has always proved to be quite useful once I started having a family and some small children around. So whilst you're sharing your experiences, let's talk about today. I'm going to start with some numbers. Uh, we have a very European audience here today. Uh, what are young people across Europe facing? So these aren't good figures, sorry. The average unemployment rate for young people aged 15 to 24 in the EU is 16.9%. That hides some stark contrast though. Spain has the highest percentage of youth unemployment at 37%, just down from a peak of 39%. EU unemployment as a whole, however, is only 7.5%. So that's 16.9, nearly 17% for young people, only 7.5 for unemployment as a whole. Whereas the last year youth unemployment was a historic low, it has now skyrocketed across the whole of Europe. In the UK in particular, there are double the number of young people claiming government support, universal credit for us, than there was this time last year. So what's this all telling us? 
It's telling us that young people have been the most affected by job losses caused by COVID. There are a lot of young people struggling right here, right now. Now, there will be some young people that we're starting to see go into entry level jobs who've just skipped out, for want of a better description, although I'm sure they'll say they didn't skip. It wasn't as much fun as university used to be, but they're skipping in to uh, entry level positions with their degrees in hand which is making those entry level positions so much more hard, so much more competitive for those who are further from the labor market i can remember leaving uni consistently not getting through online assessments it did not cross my mind that my dyslexia may have been a barrier i had been told throughout school uh, and my parents had always believed in me that i could be whatever i wanted to be but not all young people have that privilege. For so many, these sorts of barriers into employment can feel really, really hard to climb. The media is starting to talk about the risk of a lost generation, but if we act boldly, this doesn't need to be the fate of our young people. We can do something about it. As business leaders, I believe we have a responsibility to be part of the solution to grow back stronger post COVID and not the problem. How do we challenge our organisations to recruit for potential and to support young people who face barriers to the labour market even before COVID-19 hit? The hardest hit who struggled pre-COVID are now struggling so much more and therefore the moral case for Strange has never been greater. So I regularly challenge business leaders to seek those young people out as they make their next hires because we need to take the extra step to consider character and attitude over neat CVs. We need to look for potential and be prepared to develop it. As a movement, we help build impactful programmes to continue to develop evidence and insights into what is really working. I believe many of you are already working with businesses, so I'm about to do my next bit of research, but before I do, Melissa, what are we hearing about people's work experiences, those on the call? Have I still got Melissa? No, I've lost Melissa. No. It's okay, I'm here. I was just, just waiting to be brought back onto the screen. Thanks, Sam. So some really interesting ones. So delivering milk, learnt about talking to customers, washing up mountains of dishes at the local cafe. Someone worked at the fire brigade. Um, worked at the Care Home for the Elderly as part of the Duke of Edinburgh Award, very um, personal at the moment, loading lorries in a toilet roll warehouse, we go, uh, mowing lawns at service stations at the age of 14, uh, tobacco, tobacconist shop, uh, working in a bar, summer worker at a care home for the elderly, uh, horse, working with horses, uh, local shoe shop, butchery, um, sold till rolls to shops and businesses in Liverpool. Sounds a good one. Summer job in a flower shop. Oh, here we go. I was a mascot in a football game. That sounds, uh, <laughs> sounds great. I don't think we should discuss football today, Melissa. No, maybe no. Let's not get onto that topic, hey? <laughs> um, two weeks work experience, uh, age 15, for what was Dean Witter Securities, now part of Morgan Stanley, as a financial futures clerk on the London Futures Exchange. Definitely taught me how to prioritise in a busy work environment. Um, and then someone else saying I, I was working as a kitchen porter. And then I don't want to end on a negative note, really, but this is the last one that's coming at the graveyard. It was a summer job. There we go. So a whole, whole load of interesting a mix there. I think. And hopefully that has helped uh, either listening to Melissa or just writing down, reminding your, ourselves of the sorts of things that we did when we first started our careers because actually those opportunities are few and far between at the moment and what movement to work is all about is giving young people those opportunities that are just not naturally there for them at the moment so now your next challenge when i was thinking about uh, preparing for this it dawned on me that as movement to work we uh, deal with a whole ha host of uh, uk businesses that have very much a global footprint and there is an opportunity in talking to you all and you all starting to talk to each other remotely about how do we share best practice more uh, so this is where my second piece of research question comes from I'd like you to uh, think of the top five businesses or 
largest five organisations you work with or the organisation if you're a business yourself that you represent in Europe? Um, let's get the names out there. Who are the biggest organisations for you delivering work experience opportunities for young people? So to give you an example in for Movement to Work, um, if we don't, it, within the public sector, it's very much the army and the NHS. In retail, it's Marks and Spencers and Tesco. But we've also got some phenomenal programmes that are really creative and agile, working with the likes of Accenture, Diageo and BAE Systems. If we can just start to share in the chat the names of some of these businesses and which country you're working in with them, I think there could be a huge opportunity here to share where we're both working with the same organisation and look at what's working for you and how we might be able to support each other. Ultimately, we need to remember as business leaders that we are often part of the problem in this space. We need to change our attitudes and our biases when thinking about future skills and talent pipeline. Diversity, inclusion, in work poverty, youth crime, these issues are not new. They're far from new. They're the reason that Movement to Work was founded in 2013. COVID has forced many of us to take a long, hard look at what really matters. Let's not use COVID-19 as an excuse to do less, but it needs to be our wake up call. We all need to do more. And many of the movement really are. So here's some examples of some of the programmes that we run at Movement to Work. So Marks and Spencers over the last year has really lent into supporting those young people furthest from the uh, labour market and have committed an extra 500 what they call Marks and Starts placements and 360 of a UK government funded kickstart programme. Tesco's in the last 12 months have added an extra thousand kickstart work placements alongside their 600 that they already do. And Accenture committed to not only growing the number of participants, but have really lent into on what a hybrid online work experience model could look like. All brilliant. Now, what I hear from business leaders is they tell me that a focus on purpose is the best possible strategy for them for both profitability and long term success. Sustainability has stopped just being about finance, government, governance, sorry, or the environment. But youth employment is not just a CSR box ticking exercise. It's about the sustainable development goals. It's about high impact, long term sustainable strategies that are embedded across our businesses and focused on true change ground up. So whether or not you're a CEO or a mentor or an educator or a youth worker, our young people are looking for you to help to give them the future they deserve. COVID gives us a unique opportunity now on the table. Amid what the World Economic Forum has labelled the Great Reset, it's the chance for business leaders to anchor economic recovery with new levels of equality and investment in skills. I know this landscape is really complex, but we can support you to do the right thing. The sustainability I personally believe in is where business leaders are driving better ways of doing business for the well-being of people and our planet. So that's the moral and business case for doing more. Over the last 12 months, we've been driving forward at Movement to Work our Emerge Stronger COVID-19 response campaign. It had three, has three pillars. First and foremost, putting young people first, promoting the idea that young people need to be prioritised as a demographic to be, and be supported during the pandemic. Secondly, you've heard some examples of, it's about being accessible and going digital, which was all about encouraging our partners to innovate and find ways to use digital programmes that can be accessed from home. And third, support and empower, which was about making people aware of mental health effects as a result of the pandemic. We have been really impressed with the ways our network have responded to these pillars. Be Accessible Go Digital in particular received so much support from the civil service at Censure, BT, Diageo and Catch22 and so many other partners pivoted to deliver fantastic experiences for young people online. There's so much that comes good that comes from reaching young people in this way but there are some big watch outs that I wanted to mention. 
remember to think of the darker side of digital and the ways that our so-called digital natives are struggling with life online. Whether or not it's because we forgot that not every young people has the privilege, young person has the privilege of high-speed internet and quality devices, or the impact of, on mental health. When we think about the future of the workplace, the in-person experience is so incredibly important for our young people starting out. While seasoned professionals may be pleased to have less commuting time and more time at home, but our young people need face-to-face -face interaction so they can develop the skills we are now starting to take for granted. Young people need a mentor at their side of the office for a quick chat. So if you are a business leader, I'd like you to use your leadership roles in organisations to think what building back better means. Are you thinking youth employment and skills development when you contract for new business, when you procure new services, as well as reviewing your talent model? If you're a youth charity, think about how to build a coalition with businesses and government to tackle access to employment. And always remember when talking to businesses about youth employment programmes, you're not a charity supporting young people. You're a business service providing a diverse talent pool and they need you. I've always found the energy young people bring inspiring. However, look a little deeper and they bring skills and talent for an ever evolving workforce. But it's tough out there, in particular, if you've been in the criminal justice system, a refugee in care, homeless, BAME or living with a disability. And moving into employment, developing skills and financial independence is the start of giving everyone an opportunity and freedom to be the best they can be. Let's collaborate to encourage more businesses to run employability programmes and always remember that young people work. Thank you. Now, Melissa, I think I'm going to invite you back in to tell me some of the businesses that hopefully people have been sharing with in the chat and also any questions we've got. Hi, Sam, I'm back. Thank you. Sorry, so it was just a slight delay while I try and get my audio back. Um, so, yeah, uh, Barclays has been raised, uh, National Grid. Um, the municipalities, which these are some from Finnish colleagues are saying um, this. Uh, yeah, a couple of, of colleagues from Finland. And um, big store chains. Um, there's a name of a Finnish store chain, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce, but it's in the chat for everyone to have a look at. Um, someone here is saying Nokia back in the day. So phone company, obviously, um, just scrolling down. Oh, um, my colleague, uh, Nat O'Brien, who works for our uh, National Leaving Care Benchmarking Forum, saying civil service paid internships for care leavers. And um, there are over 500 in 2020 to 21, with a target of 1,000 for next year. Um, yeah, they're the ones that have come up on that particular question. We're still getting people talking about their uh, work experience. <laughs> um, HM Land Registry is uh, one here. A forklift truck driver at a fruit and vegetable auction. There we go. <laughs> really interesting. <Brilliant. laughs> um, so yes, that's what we've got uh, there, Sam. Yeah, I don't know if you want to comment on any of those kind of companies that have come up. Yeah, I think, you know, we are, we all talk to them individually in our individual countries, don't we? And I wonder whether or not your met might like to think about having a conversation across a few of us and bringing us together to think about who are the biggest providers um, across Europe. Uh, I'm sure public service will be high up there. Of course it will. Um, but we've, I'm, I'm sure many of your colleagues will have been doing work um, in the health services, with the military, as well as the civil service that we could be sharing best practice. Uh, but also thinking about uh, organisations like Vodafone that have a very European reach. What could we be doing? How could we, how could we uh, make sure that we're making them the most impactful we possibly can? Brilliant, thank you. And um, just to encourage people then, um, we, we can move on to Q&A now, I, I think, Sam, if you're happy with that. Yeah. So do please pop any questions that you've got for Sam on anything that she said this morning into the Q&A box. Um, I just wanted to start off with one, Sam, if that's OK, because um, you, you mm. talked about digital skills in particular as, as something that you know young people are going to 
need in the majority of roles, I guess, moving forward. I just wanted to ask you about kind of pre-employability programmes and, and your thoughts on those and the importance of those as we kind of, you know, emerge from the, the pandemic in terms of skilling up young people for the future. I think this is a real challenge online, actually, Melissa. There are a huge amount of employability programmes out there at the moment, some of which are free to access. Um, but they are all quite in the hard skills space, I'd say, as opposed to the soft skills space. And actually what businesses are looking for is the soft skills and the attitude and how do you find the right person that's the right fit as opposed to those hard skills that especially the larger businesses that we work with they've got the training programs to support people with the hard skills don't they yeah. um, i would encourage any young person though to be leaning into those online uh, pre-employability skills programs and to really engage with them because in the absence of real life face-to-face -face work experience that is what they can demonstrate that they've been doing isn't it and um, and it's an opportunity to uh keep the brain going i think we've all had moments through covid lockdown <laughs> where we've struggled with that one and ensure that they're building their cv remotely um, we've recently launched a campaign in the uk that brings together vodafone and a couple of charities that's about saying young people applying for jobs need access to digital devices the same way that we all got behind school ch school children needing access to digital devices um, and how can we ensure any young person who doesn't have access to employment or education has access to a device in a space and access to data to be able to use it absolutely yeah and um, comment here um saying we also need to think local local small or niche businesses need us our high streets will need us it can bring young people closer to entrepreneurship um, i'd love to discuss a program which both regenerates our high streets and assists young people yeah i think we've all really felt that closeness to our local environment haven't we over the last 12 months and uh one would hope that this will help the resurgence of local high streets and local communities and how we all support each other more. Uh, for some young people who are struggling with social mobility though, I think there's a balance there, isn't there? That actually for um, many of the programmes that we run, it's about supporting young people who have been trapped often because of gang related um, issues in very small postcodes in our cities and actually giving them an opportunity to see what opportunities there are outside that that inner city postcode can be equally important. Um, working with um, a group of entrepreneurs though and uh, thinking about high streets and how young people can support that I think would be a really exciting project to do. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for that comment. Um, any more? We've got about five minutes left. So any more comments? Keep them coming. Um, Sam, I wanted to pick up on the um, point about apprenticeships and just thinking about some of the movement to work members and businesses. You know, what, what's your sense of their view on apprenticeships? I mean, I know in the UK there have been sort of financial incentives put into businesses, uh, you know, to take on a, apprentices. What's your, what's your view of a, a, apprenticeships in, in the light of the recovery? So it, for those um, colleagues on the call who aren't from within the UK, the UK launched a programme this year called Kickstart, which was about providing young people with six months uh, in a job that was created purely for Kickstart and government effectively pays for it to give them the experience. And uh, what businesses are saying to us is the ability to support that young person in the way that Kickstart has allowed them to, if we can now take that model and use it in the apprenticeships world, that would be gold star. Because what Kickstart gives you an ability to do is provide support through Catch-22 or another youth organisation that young people need, especially if they were quite far from the labour market and provide that soft skills support around the young person. And what businesses are saying to me is in order to make apprenticeships work more for those people further from the labour market, we need a model that looks more like Kickstart in order to be able to support them. Yeah, really interesting. OK, um, let's let's start to bring this to, to a close. But um, you started off your talk, Sam, with with some 
quite sort of uh, depressing statistics, I suppose, in terms of youth youth unemployment. Um, what what you, you know are you optimistic about the future? Do you think that there are that the schemes in place are going to help? Do you think you know that, that there's there's enough kind of enthusiasm and commitment from business to to invest in in young people and and help us out of this? What's what's your kind of closing message, I, I guess, on that front? I think my closing message is for uh, anybody on the call who works for a business is lean in and do more. Think about all those vacancies you have sitting in your organization where you're looking for someone with two to three years work experience and nobody's applying for them at the moment because nobody wants to move between their organizations. How do you redesign that job so that you don't need somebody with two to three years experience but you invest in them for a year because what we know is if you invest in young people furthest from the labor market they will stay with you and they will be very loyal and uh, their productivity in the longer term is much much higher than somebody who just comes in for a couple of years so if you're a business think about how you can recruit differently and work differently so that you're creating diverse talent pools that actually reflect the customers that you are there to serve if you're a youth organization, I would be saying that we collectively have a role at the moment to inspire young people. It has been really, really tough on them. Um, you know, for people, dare I say, like me in my 40s, we've been through some recessions. We've been through um, economic challenges in the past and we know, we know what happens next. We can see what has happened historically. Actually, I'm really struck when I talk to young people about this is the first time it's happened to them. Uh, for many young people who were uh, quite away from the labour market to begin with, uh, they've been living in multi-generational houses. Uh, their communities have been really badly hit by COVID um, and they have lost hope, actually. So my, my message to probably the majority of the the people on the call is how do we inspire these young people to say it's spring the world is starting to open up in the UK I realize this isn't necessarily the message across the whole of Europe at the moment but when you get to that stage in Europe of your individual country's roadmap uh, you're going to need to inspire young people to think about their careers again and really get excited about the opportunities out there and to think about how the world has changed during this period um, particularly the healthcare sector has always really struggled to recruit in this space and they have got a huge amount of opportunities there at the moment um, and as a generation our young people uh, are more likely to lean in at the moment to wanting to do something in that public service space how do we make these jobs exciting for them and give them career opportunities and give them that future and drive that at the moment it feels like is just is just lacking a bit. Thank you, Sam. That's great. And thank you so much for your time this morning. Really fascinating. We've had some great comments and a, a lot of interaction in the in the chat box. So that's fantastic. Uh, wonderful. Well, um, it's now coming up to quarter past 10. We're going to take a short break. Please do remember to visit the um, expo booths if you've if you've got some time to do so and have an explore there and um, workshops. So the first set of workshops will commence at 1030 a.m. promptly. So that's in 15 minutes time. So please click on the sessions tab on the left hand side of your screen and then the name of the workshop that you'd like to attend and you can join a little bit early um, if you wish and uh, we will kick those off at 10 30. thanks so much everyone see you shortly <laughs>